Namaste. We move forward with management of threatened species and today we will have a look at ex situ conservation. Now we looked in the previous lecture uh, at the differences between in situ and ex situ conservation. Now in situ as we learned was on site conservation, conservation within the natural habitat such as uh, construction of uh, reserves, national parks or wildlife sanctuaries and ex situ conservation is conservation that is off site outside the natural environment such as zoos or aquaria. So, if we have uh, in situ uh, conservation option that is available with us, why should we go with ex situ conservation? What are the requirements of setting up an ex situ conservation facility? Well, it is required for critically endangered species that require a very heavy amount of attention because we have very few number of individuals that are left because it provides urgent intervention to these species. Now, for instance, if you have a species that has say around 20,000 individuals left in the world, so you probably will not require an ex situ conservation facility to conserve that particular species because that can be taken care of by the in situ conservation facilities. But suppose you have an individual that has only around 15 individuals that are left in the world. Now, those 15 individuals cannot be left in, in the wild because in absence of uh, of very uh, large amount of uh, attention to those species, probably those 15 individuals would die off in a very short period of time. Because probably there are people who want to poach those animals. Uh, a very good example is that of Javan rhinoceros. So, we have these rhino, uh, we had these rhinoceros rather in Java and such huge was the demand to poach these animals that, uh, that even though we had very few numbers left and it was very extensively documented that we have very few numbers left, people went there and continued the poaching. Now, in the case of ex situ conservation, we can take some of these individuals out and we can give them an extra amount of protection and an extra amount of care, we can protect them from all different diseases, so that at least this species continues to survive. At the same time, ex situ conservation also is required, so that you can bring in more funds for the cause of conservation. So, for instance, if people come into a zoo, if people get uh, can come to an aquarium and see that there are so many varieties of fishes that are that are available in this world, so people would get encouraged towards the cause of conservation. They would become champions of conservation themselves just by observing all these different species. So, that is also another importance of setting up an ex situ conservation facility because for those species that are living very deep inside the forest or very deep inside the oceans, it, be, it becomes very difficult for a large population to go and visit those, those species to, un, to know more and more about those species. But if you can bring some individuals out, then they also uh, get a chance to see those individuals. So, what is the process of setting up an ex situ conservation facility? Well, first you designate areas with suitable conditions and facilities are created for in those particular areas. Then uh, these facilities include things such as feeding, enclosure, veterinary support and so on. Then you uh, select certain individuals of these species, move them into these designated areas for their survival and breeding and if necessary after a while some individuals of these uh, from these uh, uh, conservation facilities can be then taken out and then released into the wild in the in situ conservation areas. So, that is an optional step that can be done in certain situations. Now, ex situ conservation provides certain advantages especially over in situ conservation. It allows better control of variables such as climate, disease, diet and so on. So, for instance, if you have a snake species, snakes prefer to live in environments that are neither too hot nor very cold. So, uh, in a snake facility in a herpetorium, you will see that there is this chamber and this chamber would probably have a small light bulb here. Now, this light bulb not only provides light, but it also provides quite a lot of warmth to the animal. Then you will have uh, certain uh, some small trees that would be growing here with lots of branches. So, that if you have, uh, uh, so if this particular snake wants to live in a more warm environment, so it will probably come and 
reside here if it wants if it does not want the warmth it will probably go and reside here so in a very small area you can provide all different sorts of uh, facilities to the animal different temperature control you can even have uh, things such as humidity control in this area so it should not be very wet because if it is very wet then probably your your snake might get might start getting some fungal infections it must not be very dry because in that case it its skin might start getting cracked so in this very small area you can give a very good amount of climate control second you can have a very good control over diseases and diet so you can ensure that your animal is neither overfed nor is it underfed you can also ensure that your animal is not suffering from any diseases it does not have any ectoparasites on its body so probably a veterinarian would go and observe these snakes and if there are ectoparasites on its body then probably it will be given some treatment for that and that is very crucial if you have very few number of of snakes of that particular species that are left in the world so they need to be given more amount of attention and care secondly it provides opportunity for close observation to better understand the species and the proximate causes of its extinction the proximate causes are those causes that are nearby so the near causes of its extinction so for instance you can observe that in this small area you see that uh, the that these particular snakes hunt at say a very particular time suppose these uh, snakes have uh, have a behavior that they are only doing their hunting say 4 to 5 in the evening and if that happens and we observe that uh, we have observed this behavior here in the in situ uh, in the ex situ conservation facility then we can make a correlation that our in situ conservation facilities such as the reserves are not providing good habitats for this particular species because we have a tourist inflow during 4 to 5 pm and if that be the the situation the learnings from the ex situ conservation facility the learnings about the behavior of the species can then be used in the in situ conservation facilities as well so that is another advantage of setting up an ex situ conservation facility third it permits intensive interventions including in vitro fertilization embryo transfer and so on so these are intensive interventions even in the case of this, this particular snake you might go and have a collection of its eggs collection of the embryos you might try to put them into hatcheries you can give individual attention to all the offsprings so this is the utility of setting up an ex situ conservation facility or these are the advantages at the same time the ex situ conservation facility also has a number of disadvantages it does not prevent loss of habitat because you are conserving these species in this very small area but then it is possible that its original habitat gets lost during the process so you were conserving these individuals but the whole ha habitat became lost and so now these animals are destined to live in ex situ conservation forever because they do not have any habitats left at all second it can be planned for only a few species at a time it is extremely cost intensive you cannot have an ex situ conservation facility for all the species that are found in a natural habitat only a few of them can be brought and given suitable conditions and study and, and kept in the ex situ conservation facility some wild behaviors may be lost because even in the case of your snake the snake would not learn how to uh, catch its prey in the wild situations because it is getting mice that are kept into its chamber at fixed times every day or your tiger might not even learn how to hunt because it is getting a dead animal that is a, a dead carcass that is kept into its uh enclosure every day so a number of wild behaviors get lost in this process captive bred and raised individuals may find it difficult when reintroduced because they have lost a number of their behaviors it may increase chances of inbreeding if not planned properly because you ha only have a few number of individuals that are kept in the ex situ conservation facility again because it is costly and it requires a space and it requires a very huge amount of interventions so if you have a few number of individuals the mating between those might lead to inbreeding and then uh, as expectedly it is extremely costly the examples of ex situ conservation include zoos aquariums uh, captive breeding facilities botanical gardens bamboo seta bamboo seta are, are areas where different bamboo species are grown arboreta where different tree species are grown seed banks crab preservation facilities that uh, cater to tissue cultures sperm banks ova banks and so on so these are all different examples of ex situ conservation facilities now it is not possible or it is not worthwhile to have an ex situ conservation facility for all the species 
So, for instance, this particular paper compared the, the, the population growth rates in in situ that is in white and in ex situ that is in black conditions for different species. Now, here we observe that for certain species, we see that the ex situ conservation facility uh, provides a better environment for the animals because the growth rate in, in ex situ is much greater than that in the in situ conditions. Whereas, in certain organisms, the in situ growth rate is much greater and when you put the animal in an ex situ conservation facility, it does uh, the population does not grow as fast. So, it does not make any sense to keep this animal in the ex situ conservation facility, you will have to go for the in situ conservation facility only. Besides, if we compare the cost between uh, in situ and ex situ conservation, we find that normally the cost for the ex situ conservation facility is much greater. For some organisms, it is a little greater, for some organisms, it is very high, whereas for some organisms, it might even be lesser in certain uh, circumstances. So, if you have a very small species, for example, if you have a species uh, of rodents, you can uh, grow them in this particular room itself. Whereas, in the wild you would require a, a forest that needs to be used for that particular purpose. So, if you compare the cost, the cost have a lot to do with the size of the organism. For organisms with a low body size, the ex situ costs are typically lesser than that of the in situ cost. Whereas, for larger sized organisms, the ex situ costs are much greater than that of the in situ cost. So, typically we can say that this is the size range within which your captive breeding might be cheaper and in these circumstances, if the organism is responding well to captive breeding, then ex situ conservation makes a lot of sense as compared to in situ conservation. However, we need to note that there are certain genetic implications of ex situ conservation. One is stochastic sampling of alleles. When samples are taken for a seed bank for instance, the sampling may select some alleles while discard some other alleles in a stochastic manner, in a random manner or in a chance manner. Thus, some amount of natural variation will get lost in the sampling process. This needs to be compensated by extensive sampling from different geographical locations and a meticulous collection of natural variations in the form of alleles. So, what this is saying is that for different organisms, you have some amount of variation that is present between different individuals of the species. So, for instance, even in our case, different human beings will have different heights, they will have different skin color, different eye color, different color of the hair and so on. Now, if you are selecting a few individuals for your, ex, uh, for your ex situ conservation facility, then because by definition it is a very costly process and because by definition you are constrained by the size and you will only keep a very few number of individuals into your ex situ conservation facility. So, when you are selecting individuals, then probably a, a number of traits will get lost. So, for instance, in the case of tigers, if you look at tigers of Sundarbans, so Sundarbans is a very marshy area and tigers have to do a lot of swimming. And so, uh, it is typically seen that, that uh, the tigers there are much lighter as compared to tigers of Madhya Pradesh, which uh, live predominantly in a very dry environment and they also have a very large bo body size. Now, if you had, if you set up in ex situ conservation facility for say tigers and if you only selected tigers from Sundarbans or only selected tigers from Madhya Pradesh, then the other variations that are present in the natural population will get lost. Now, to compensate for that, it is essential that you go out and look at different variations that are present in the population and make an active attempt to bring all those variations into your ex situ conservation facility. So, that is one genetic implication. The second is that you observe erosion of genetic variation in the absence of natural selection. So, in the ex situ conservation facility, all the individuals are getting sufficient food, all the individuals are getting sufficient care, veterinary care, medicines and so on. So, uh, there would be some amount of genetic variation that becomes lost because you are not actively selecting for those genetic variations as is done in the case of natural selection. So, for instance, in the case of tigers, the natural selection would select for those individuals that are able to hunt properly. Whereas, if you keep your animals in the zoos generation after generation, because you are not selecting for those particular variations, some of those variations might get lost after a few generations. Third is genetic correlations of pleiotropy. Some gene, uh, uh, for example, same gene may increase uh, cryopreservation stability, but decrease the number of seeds produced. 
then selection of plants producing seeds with, with better cryopreservation and stability will also result in selection of plants with less number of seeds which would be antagonistic to the objectives of reintroduction. What it says is that when you are setting up uh, an ex situ conservation facility, then the, uh, the environment that you are providing to the organisms in the ex situ conservation facility are very different from what you are providing in the in situ conservation facility or in their natural habitat. So, for instance, if you have uh, a plant that is found in uh, different uh, heights in the mountain uh, and uh, suppose you are setting up uh, an ex situ conservation facility in this particular area. Now, what you are doing is that you uh, started by looking at different variations, you brought all of these plants into your area and then you started growing them. So, you, uh, you brought these seeds, you uh, went ahead and planted those in your ex situ conservation area and then you uh, took out those plants that were giving out the largest number of seeds and then you stored those seeds. Now, what happens in that case is that because you could you can have a trait that is regulating the, uh, the number of seeds that is being produced by the, by the plant and is probably also regulating some other trait. So, by selecting for those plants that are giving out more number of seeds, you are also selecting for some other trait. Now, that some other trait might not be useful for the plant in the natural conditions. So, probably when you were doing an in situ conservation, so that particular trait was not being selected, that was not useful to the plants. But when you are shifting it to the ex situ conservation facility, so in that case that particular trait is now getting selected because of the pleiotropic effect, because the same gene is regulating more than one. Uh, one traits in this organism. So, if we have a situation of pleiotropy, then it is possible that we might be selecting for those traits that are not useful to the plants in the in situ conservation uh, scenario or in the natural habitat. So, later on when we use these seeds and we, we, we plant them out in the natural habitat to restock the population, then it is possible that all of these plants would die off. So, that is also another genetic implication of ex situ conservation. And the fourth one is the genotype environment interactions. Those genotypes showing favorable phenotypes in the ex situ conservation environment may not show favorable phenotypes when put back for reintroduction. So, like coming back to our example of these plants that were growing in the hills. Now, probably the environment that you have here is uh, very much correlated with the environment that you have in this particular area. Now, your plants grow in these areas, they are not growing in this area. Now, when you are taking these seeds out and you are growing them in your ex situ conservation facility, then it is possible that you are only selected for selecting for those plants that are able to grow well in this particular environment and not in these particular environments. So, later on when you put your plants back into the wild, it is possible that they might not show good results, which is because of the genotype environment interactions. So, those genotypes showing favorable phenotypes in the ex situ conservation environment may not show favorable phenotypes when put back for reintroduction. And it is also possible that uh, when you are uh, looking for say seeds, you are looking for seed production, you want to have those plants that are giving out the most amount of seeds. When you are putting them into your environment of ex situ conservation, then they, uh, then the, the number of seeds that are being produced by every individual is very different from one what it would have produced when it was there in its natural habitat. So, by because of this genotype environment interaction, you might be selecting for a wrong individual or, uh, or an individual that is not the best fit for release when it is released back into the environment. So, that is also another implication. Now, we will look at three ex situ conservation facilities in detail. These are zoos, botanical gardens and seed banks and crop preservation facilities. To understand what these ex situ conservation facilities are, how do they work, what do we do there? So, we begin with zoos. Now, zoos are defined as zoo means an establishment whether stationary or mobile, uh, where captive animals are kept for exhibition to the public and includes a circus and rescue centers, but does not include an establishment of a licensed dealer in captive animals. Now, this is the definition of zoo under the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So, zoo is any establishment 
it can be stationary or it can be mobile. So, you can even have mobile zoos where animals are taken from one place to the other place. And in this, uh, uh, in this establishment, captive animals are kept for exhibition to the public. So, the main purpose is to show them to the public and it includes a circus and rescue centers. So, if you have a circus, a circus by definition is a zoo and will be regulated by the same rules as uh, govern the zoos. And it also includes rescue centers. So, rescue centers are areas where you bring animals that are say diseased or say uh, that, uh, that are suffering from some injuries or that have strayed out and you bring them into an area uh, to, uh, to treat those animals and probably later release them into the wild or probably keep them there in captivity for a very long time. So, rescue centers are also zoos under this definition and it does not include an establishment of a licensed dealer in captive animals. Now, zoos are governed using master plans. So, master plan is a document that will uh, tell you what are the facilities that are available, what are the objectives of management and what are we uh, and how are we going to uh, uh, attain those objectives of management. So, zoos are governed under master plan. A number of zoos are involved in conservation breeding. So, conservation breeding is where you, you do some amount of captive breeding of the animals to conserve their species. And for these conservation breedings, there are also stud books that are maintained. So, a stud book uh, is a document that, that tells you the genetic ancestry of any particular individual. Now, these are important to ensure that you do not uh, breed uh, between individuals that are very closely related to each other. So, to, to prevent situations of inbreeding depression, you maintain these documents which tell you that for any particular individual who was its mother, who was its father, who were, was the mother's relatives, uh, I mean, uh, so in the case of the mother, who was the father of the mother, who was the mother of the mother, in the case of the father, who was the mother of the father, who was the father of the father and so on. So, it maintains a genetic ancestry of all the animals and so if you observe, the, uh, if you want to uh, to conduct uh, captive breeding between two individuals and if you find that both of these individuals uh, share a, uh, a, uh, share an ancestor in the, in the near past. So, in that case you will not go for a breeding between these individuals. Now, as I now to understand what we do in a zoo, we will look at the case study of Masood Zoo. Now, in a zoo the animals are provided with conditions that best suit their requirements and that best suit their behavior. For instance, in the case of these tigers, they are given a plain area that has ample number of, uh, of trees to provide shade, that has these grasses, that has this waterfall to provide cooling comfort. In the case of their enclosures, they are given these logs, so that their uh, scratching behavior that they normally show in the wild to mark their, their territories and so on are also maintained in these areas. Feeding is a very important part of maintaining an, of maintaining any animal, and so uh, like these cobras are uh, being given these white-colored mice that are bred for this for this purpose. Then you also maintain uh, uh, a very good amount of sanitation in your area so that all the fruits and vegetables that are brought for different animals are washed, cleaned, cut, and then served to the animals. And then feeding is done in a very timely manner and it is done with a lot of precaution. So, this is showing us this is the outer portion of the enclosure of a tiger and here we have this gate and this person is opening up this gate so that the animal can get inside and inside you have already put uh, the meat that needs to be given to the, to the tiger. So, when you open this gate from outside the animal is able to reach to the inside room and is able to feed. Now, these feeding times, the amount of feed that needs to be given, the, uh, the timing of the feed, the regularity of the feed, all are very carefully governed in a zoo. And this is done not only for the indigenous animals, but also in the case of exotic animals, they have very exotic requirements. So, a number of uh, plants that a giraffe eats are may not be available in India. So, a giraffe might be given some special food to take care of its dietary requirements. Similarly, for zebras, for cheetahs and so on. And all of these are maintained in the form of a documentation. So, uh, the feed charts will be, will be maintained when an animal was 
treated in a veterinary facility, what was it treated for, what kinds of diseases did it have, what are the kinds of vaccinations that are given to this animal are all properly documented. And then you also have a number of facilities for providing veterinary care to these animals. So, we looked at this example of uh, a squeeze cage. So, in a squeeze cage the animal is brought inside to this cage and then these walls are then moved together. So, that the animal gets squeezed between the walls and then you can very easily handle this animal if you want to take out a blood sample for, uh, for laboratory analysis or if you want to give it some injection of an antibiotic or so on. So, it can be handled in that way. You also have facilities for, uh, uh, for doing x-rays of animals, for, for performing uh, surgeries on these animals, you have an operating theatre and so on. So, all these different facilities are maintained for the benefit of these animals. Then not only are these animals provided with these facilities, but also their behavior is also studied in these ex situ conservation facilities. So, research becomes an integral part of an ex situ conservation facility, so that we learn more and more about these animals and these learnings can be made use of in the in situ conservation facilities as well. And not only is uh, research done, but at the same time in reach is also done. So, you also call experts from different areas and you uh, ask them what more can be done for these animals. You also maintain a number of samples for, uh, for these animals. So, a number of embryos that were aborted or the shells of the eggs of different birds uh, from which uh, the, the young ones have had, they are, they are also kept here in a curated manner. At the same time, ex situ conservation facilities play a very important role as areas where we can look out for eco-friendly alternatives. So, the, they also become areas for experimentation. If you observe that there is certain uh, uh, some eco-friendly uh, mode of transport that you can use in these areas, then probably some of these learnings can also be uh, translated back into the in situ conservation facilities. Then we also uh, work on a number of other projects such as how to convert say dung into manure, how to, to, re, uh, to reduce the parasitic load that is there in the dung, so that it can be made use of in other places and so on uh, such other activities are also done. Now, a very important role of zoo is that they permit people to come and visit and observe the animals. So, caring of people also becomes a very important part. So, for instance, you will observe uh, these uh, notices. So, you have uh, disabled friendly environments, you have even wheelchairs that are available in these areas, you have facilities for drinking water, you have facilities for doctors, you have facilities for uh, golf carts, so that people can um, move in these areas, you have uh, places for, for people to sit and so on. So, uh, so, the ex situ conservation facilities also need to cater not just to the needs of the animals, but also to the needs of the human beings. And in that case, image building, revenue, ticketing also play a very important part. Also, in the case of ex situ conservation facilities, you can also have facilities such as these uh, areas where you grow, where you cultivate orchids or an in house aviary or an open aviary or an area where you have. Uh, cultivation of cacti. So, all these cactuses are brought from different areas and they are cultivated in this area, so that you are able to conserve these cactus as well. So, different organisms are kept in the ex situ conservation facilities for their conservation. Now, zoos also include the rescue uh, centers. So, an example of a rescue center is this rescue center at Agra. This is the bear rescue facility in which any bears that are orphaned or that have been rescued from, from uh, calendars are brought to this area. They are provided uh, uh, large enclosures in which they can lead their life. They are provided with ample amount of food and care and nutrition and so on. Another rescue facility is that of the lion rescue facility that is there in Bhopal or a turtle rescue facility that is there in Dwarika. Now, in this rescue facility, the eggs of the turtles are brought to these rescue facilities because turtles have this habit that they come to the uh, sea beaches and there uh, they make a nest and there they lay their eggs. Now, with time we have observed that uh, there are a number of street dogs or pariah dogs that come into these nests and eat up the eggs. So, when that happens, the population of turtle uh, suffers a decline. Now, to 
avoid that what people do in this rescue facility is that they bring the eggs from the sea beaches and then in this covered enclosure uh, where you have these uh, wire uh, uh, meshes all around so that dogs cannot enter into this area there they uh, uh, make a make a hole in the form of the nest and there they keep all these eggs inside these areas and once the turtles have hatched so then they are moved into these in house areas uh, so that they can grow to a, a particular size and after that they are released back into the seas now in the zoos it is also important that you need to pay a very huge amount of it of attention to the behavior of the animals here what we are observing is a stereotype behavior what this elephant is doing is that it is just moving right and left in this repetitive manner because it is getting a sense of boredom now when that happens you need to uh, provide the animal with certain amount of behavioral enrichment this animal should have something to do so behavioral enrichment also forms a very important part of the zoos as part of the ex situ conservation measures now the second ex situ conservation facility that we'll observe is a botanical garden a botanical garden is a garden dedicated to the collection cultivation and display of a wide range of plants labeled with their botanical names so here you bring plants from the from different areas you cultivate them and you display them along with their botanical names so that there can be some amount of research there can be some amount of education that people can have uh, if they come and visit these botanical gardens these botanical gardens uh, play a number of roles they help in conservation awareness they help uh, to develop this interest in gardening information network for pr for propagation of scientific information access to seeds and plant transfer sites repository of biodiversity educational sites especially for relation between plants and ecology sources of botanochemicals so some amount of research can also be done on different plant chemicals that are there in the botanical garden availability of plants for scientific research study of plant diversity and identification so for people who are interested in or are learning the sciences of taxonomy and systematics a botanical garden plays a very important role because because you can visit these areas and look at trees their different adaptations their the patterns of their leaves the patterns of their branches and so on so that you are able to make a sense of how to identify a particular species and they also play a very important role in the protection of rare species because here you are providing a very controlled environment to the rare species when you are cultivating them so the rare species will also get sufficient amount of nutrition fertilizers water and so on now to know what a uh, what a botanical garden looks like we'll have a look at the uh, the case study of christian bock botanical garden which is there in cape town now christian bock happens to be a world heritage site so it has these christian bock forests uh, which are very unique to to that particular ecosystem uh, they go by the name of flynn boss forest and in this case the botanical gardens are set up in a location where you can have a variety of habitats so here you have these uh, hills and then you also have the scarplands and then you have the plain lands so all of these different areas provide a, a wide variety of habitats for the plants to grow and uh, after cultivation these plants are also made available for exhibitions so uh, this is one exhibit in which you have this road and you can take a walk on this road and you can look at different plants and all of these plants are labeled with their names so you can understand what kind of plant grows in what particular habitat conditions and so on so people visit these areas to look at uh, plants to even uh, people who are interested in studying insects can come to this area to study different kinds of pollinators or different kinds of birds that are there in this area or even things like snakes that are found in uh, in these forests so they provide an access to nature and play a very important role in educating people so you would observe that uh, some parents would come to this area with their kids and they would be telling what are trees what are leaves uh, how do they make food what is photosynthesis and so on so people can spend time here they can even spend family time here uh, between the nature and the idea here is that the more time people spend with nature the more they can relate to the cause of conservation 
and so when people are coming to this area every day if later on there is a proposal that this garden should be closed so in that case there would be so many people who would vehemently oppose such a, a such a proposition at the same time because these people know what different plants look like if there is an area that is uh, suffering from a decline in, in a species there would be a number of people who would write to policy makers who would like who would write to law makers to conserve those species so this is the idea so you can uh, spend a lot of time here you can observe uh, different species and uh, uh, just to ensure that people have a, a quality time you also have a number of shops you also have a cafeteria so that people can just spend their time there so again in the case of an xc2 conservation facility it is extremely important that people should be able to visit these facilities now there are also some attractions in the form of canopy walk so now this is the canopy walk what they have done here is that here you have the canopy of trees and there is this bridge and this bridge moves through the canopy of trees and in certain locations it moves above the canopy of the trees so essentially if we look at any tree for any large size tree when we are observing the tree we are generally at this level so we are able to see the uh, stem of the tree but we uh, and we can observe some uh, uh, we can also observe the leaves of the, of the tree but we can never observe the canopy of the tree now for observing the canopy you have to be at this level now the canopy walk is a large bridge in which you can while while walking through this bridge you can get to the level of the canopy so you, the canopy is at your eye level and you can even go above the canopies so this is how it looks like so you have different trees and this canopy walk is even uh, above quite a number of stems and here also you have have a number of educational play cards so it, like this one is telling you what is a tree canopy what are different kinds of canopies this is the canopy this is middle story this is under story this is forest floor and so on so the xc2 conservation facilities play a very important role in giving in imparting education to the people who are visiting these areas then this play card tells you about life in a tree canopy so what are different kinds of birds that live in this area what are different kinds of organisms that live in this area how they uh, they work together in a food chain or in a food web and so on then it also tells you about the biodiversity that is there in the canopy so these are all birds that are found in the canopies so when you go to these areas you can get a sense of uh, of uh, what is the level of biodiversity in different parts so when you are walking on the ground you can see different biodiversity when you are walking at the level of the branches you can see different biodiversity when you are walking in the canopy you can see a different biodiversity or things such as uh, how this canopy walk is constructed so engineering learnings and so on then you have historical learnings you have learnings about the geology of the place you have learnings about the habitat requirements of different species so for instance this particular play card tells you that there is this species that lives in the shade of the trees so here you can observe that you have tall trees and then you have this particular bush like uh, species that is living in this particular area now this play card is telling you what are the adaptations why this species prefers this particular area and now when you go to these areas you get a a very good uh, idea of uh, what is biodiversity and why different species live in different areas what are what do you mean by niches that are used by different species then it also gives you a message about uh, conservation by talking about dinosaurs or by talking about different areas which have different species or by talking about uh, the the indigenous species the ground cover species the kinds of adaptations that are there in different species and so on so essentially in a botanical garden what you have is you have an area which is an xc2 conservation area because all of these species are not naturally found in this area they have been planted in these areas so seeds were brought from different areas and planted here then they are given a lot of care and attention and once these species have come up into this area then these species are used for conservation in a number of ways one way is that 
by having these plants here even if their natural habitat suffers a, de a decline you still have these species here and you can always collect seeds and you can repopulate the original area or you can substantiate the population of the original area or by observing these uh, these different species you can make a correlation about the requirements of these different species when do these plants flower when do do these plants uh, produce fruits when are the seeds that are there in the fruits when are uh, when are they they alive when are they dead and so on so all these information can be made use of in the in situ conservation facilities as well then they are very important for conservation because they provide access of pe uh, access to people to nature so in this case when people are coming to these areas they can look at biodiversity they can understand what are adaptations they can understand why do we need so many different kinds of species to exist on this planet because uh, on a very superficial understanding some person might say that okay you have trees in this area that is good enough because you are getting photosynthesis you are getting uh, carbon dioxide that is getting sequestered and oxygen that is getting released why do you, why should you have so many different kinds of species but then once you have been to such an area you get this idea of why these different species are important then you also get an idea of what are the adaptations that are there in these different species you also get an idea of how these species are related to each other how is the plant kingdom related to the animal kingdom which particular trees provide uh, uh, nest nesting sites to different birds which particular trees provide fruits to different birds and so on and by uh, by uh, allowing people to understand nature they uh, um, the idea of, uh, of of a botanical garden is that uh, people would become aligned to the cause of conservation now the third ex situ conservation facility that we'll observe is a seed bank or a cryopreservation facility now the idea of a seed bank or a crop preservation facility is that even if you have uh, seeds that are very old say even 30000 year old seeds and if they have been kept in a very cold area then they continue to survive and then uh, even if you take those seeds today so even after 30000 years you can plant them and they'll give out uh, the plants and the flowers or those species that are uh, those seeds that are kept in very dry atmospheres so even after thousands of years you can take those seeds and you can grow plants out of them so essentially if you take a seed and you keep it in an environment that is cold and in an environment that is dry you are able to retain the viability and if you are able to retain the viability so in if you want to conserve a number of species you can do a very simple thing that you can collect the seeds from all these different species and then you can keep them in cold and dry conditions and that becomes a very good repository of all these different species so that is the idea behind a seed bank or a cryopreservation facility so let us begin by looking at what a seed is a seed is an embryonic plant that is enclosed in an outer protective coating so essentially this is an embryonic plant so given suitable conditions it will give rise to the plant that is the most important thing and it is covered in a in a protective coating and seeds are found in fruits so here we see some fruits of a tree and uh, these fruits have so many seeds inside so you can collect these seeds now if you want to construct a seed bank where these seeds can be stored what are the steps that you will do the first is to construct a seed stand a seed stand is an area in which you have trees that give out a lot of seeds so that you can collect these seeds from there or else if you are not uh, constructing a seed stand you can directly go into the forest area and collect the seeds of different trees but then seed stand helps because you can uh, have access to a massive amount of seed once you have collected these seeds you treat these seeds now treatment consists of things such as depulping so seeds are there inside the fruits if you have the pulp along with the seeds so pulp has a lot of moisture it also has a lot of uh, feeding materials it has uh, sugars it has carbohydrates and so on so you you will have animals that will come and eat up these seeds or you will have some amount of fungal infestation in these seeds so to to remove that possibility you treat these seeds 
So, you remove the pulp and then you dry these seeds. After drying or after this treatment, you store the seeds under proper conditions and those conditions are cold climate and dry climate. And if required, you recollect seeds from the wild or by replanting because even when you are putting these seeds into these cold and dry conditions, you can retain the viability for some time, but this viability is not an infinite viability. So, if you have seeds with time and here you have the viability. Now, if you have a seed that is there in the wild, then you might have a viability that goes down very fast, but then in the proper conditions, you will have a viability that goes down in a slow manner. But then suppose you, so this is your 100 percent viability and let us say, let us say that this is your 100 percent viability because even seeds that you collect from the wild will not have 100 percent viability, this is 90 percent viability. And suppose you have a condition that you want to have, you maintain uh, that you should maintain at least 80 percent of the viability. Now, if you just kept seeds as such, so probably they would lose their viability in say 2 weeks. But once you kept them in your facility, they are able to retain at least 80 percent viability up to say 2 years. Now, at the end of 2 years, you have seeds that have 80 percent viability, but then if you wait further, then the viability will go down below 80 percent. Now, to reduce that possibility, what you do is that you recollect seeds from the wild to restock your uh, seed bank or else what you can do is you take these seeds and then you replant them. And once you have replanted these seeds and especially for those uh, species that are very vigorous in their uh, growth and are very fast in their growth, so you can replant those seeds and then you can collect the seeds again and then you can restock. So, this is the process in which you maintain a seed bank. Now, the first stage what we had seen was construction of a seed stand. Now, a seed stand is an area where you are keeping the trees themselves, so that they, uh, um, they make the seeds available again and again in a large quantity. Now, if you want to construct a seed stand, how would you do that? The first step would be sampling of the source population, because you will again you will have a very great amount of uh, diversity, a great amount of variety that is available in nature and through this sampling you will come to a conclusion about what different varieties you should collect, so that your seed stand is a representative of the natural population. Next you go for a site selection, now site selection will make use of the ecological principles, if there is a plant that grows in the desert, so the site where you should set up your uh, seed stand should also be a desert area or if there is a plant that grows in a very cold area, so your, your site should also be there in a very cold area and so on. Once you have selected the site and you have sampled, next you decide on the plantation size, how many trees should you have in your area, so that you are able to uh, map the diversity that is there in the nature. So, you should have a very large number of trees, but not so large that you are not able to manage that. So, you decide on a plantation size. size. Once you have done that, now you establish the plantation. So, estab uh, establishment of the plantation would mean that in this site for this many size, you bring the seeds or you bring the plants from the wild and you plant them. So, that is establishment of a plantation. Next, you manage that plantation, you do weeding operations, irrigation, fertilization and so on. And then uh, once all these plants have uh, become mature and they are giving out fruits and seeds, so you regenerate this stand, you collect the, the seeds, probably you, you replant some of these seeds and so on. So, that is the process of construction of an XC2 conservation stand. Whereas, if you are not constructing a stand, if you are directly wanting to put it into a seed storage facility, so in that case you need to know about what are the characteristics of good seeds, what are the characteristics of a good seed bank and then bring two and two together, so that you get a very good amount of viability of these seeds. So, next we will look at the characteristics of good seeds. Good seeds are well ripened and healthy, pure and free from inert materials and weed seeds. 
so inert materials include things such as dirt or hay or uh, some other husk portion of the uh, fruit or of the seed and so on and it should be free of weed seeds so uh, when you are planting them again into the wild you should not be having any weeds they should be viable and have good germination capacity uniform in its structure and appearance free from damage and should not be broken and infested by pests and diseases now you can determine the best days for seed collection using laboratory methods and field methods so essentially when you are collecting the seeds the fruits should be completely mature and their maturity can be assessed by looking at their density looking at their colors or visual examination of the seed contents after cutting or by looking at laboratory methods such as maximum weight that can be attained whether the fruit has that been attained so that would tell us that the fruit is now com completely mature or we can have a chemical analysis of fat and nitrogen content or we can look at embryo at embryonic development and endosperm of sample seeds using x rays or we can look at moisture content of fruits and so on so there are a number of ways through which we can understand what is the best time to collect these seeds then we also determine, determine what are the best trees to collect these seeds from so we normally collect from uh, dominant or co-dominant trees because these trees get ample amount of sunlight and they are uh, generally very vigorous and very healthy and their seeds also have a very good germination capability and we collect from a number of trees because we want to have a uh, variety uh, in the seeds we collect from trees that are far apart from each other to avoid collecting from half siblings or parents because if you have a tree so if you have a tree here and it is giving out fruits and it is giving out seeds so those seeds might fall in this particular area and so if you have another seed, another tree that is so f close to each other to to the first tree then it is possible that this tree is the so this is the parent tree and this is the daughter tree in which case because these um, because both of these trees are so closely related so we might be losing out on the diversity so we try to collect from seed from trees that are far from each other before collecting we mark the individual trees and collect equal number of cones fruits or seeds per tree so that we are able to get ample amount of diversity and then mixing of seeds can be done for large scale collection so that would depend on your management objectives then we use large number of trees per gene pool random sampling including poorer than average trees because again when we say poorer than average trees there could be a tree that is not that tall that is not uh, that healthy looking but then probably that has some amount of uh, disease resistance genes that is not present in the taller trees so we even need to collect for from those trees that are not that good looking or poorer than average trees because we want to maintain as much amount of diversity as is available in nature then uh, collection in better seed years for better representation of parents so seed years are those years where trees give out a very huge copious amount of seeds so we collect in good seed years so that there is more amount of seeds and a better representation of the parents and large quantity of seeds to be collected for each provenance or for each different geographical region next uh, for uh, a proper seed collection we need to go for an organization of of good collecting teams we need to uh, make uh, arrangements for transportation equipment records permits seed extraction from fruits and so on because all of these things are time bound if you uh, have if you have collected the fruits and if you have not removed the uh, the seeds uh, fast enough so it is possible that your fruits might get infested and the seeds might also get infested so all of these need to be properly managed now the ways of collecting seeds include natural seed fall in which you can uh, make use of certain cones so you have this tree and in the uh, in the seeding season this tree would uh, naturally release the seeds outside so probably you could set up a cone like arrangement of cloth so that all these seeds when they fall from the tree they get collected in this cone and from there you can 
uh, collect them for your storage facility. So, you can make use of seed fall or you can shake the trees manually or mechanically or you can make use of tree funnels as we have seen or you can make use of uh, reading of animal caches like squirrels and ants. So, squirrels generally tend to store a large number of nut seeds into their caches and we can read those caches and get all those seeds uh, or we can collect by plucking or we can collect by cutting, breaking and sowing of the trees. Now, in a number of cases natural seed fall is not used if not together with the tree funnel because if there is a seed that has fallen to the ground then there is a good possibility that some insects or maybe some fungi or some microbes uh, have already come into contact with that seed. Similarly, reading of animal caches is not a very preferred option because here again uh, the, the cache of a squirrel uh, might uh, have a damp situation in which you might have uh, fung uh, fungal infestation on the seeds. Then the other operations include depulping, removing of the pulp, drying under the shade, sun drying, artificial drying, deweighing, threshing, sieving, sorting, blowing, grading and so on. So, essentially by all these methods what we are trying to do is that we are trying to get to the best possible seeds in the best possible state, which is a seed that is devoid of any other fruit contents, it should not be having any amount of pulp or any amount of husk with it and it should be in a dry state. And uh, we also perform grading to get the best quality seeds, so they are, uh, they are mostly large size seeds. Now, if you look at natural longevity of seeds, we can divide seeds into three categories, microbiotic in which the seed lifespan does not exceed 3 years mesobiotic where the seed lifespan is from 3 to 15 years and macrobiotic where there is uh, the, the, the lifespan is greater than 15 years. And uh, whether or not we can dry a seed by this process we divide seeds into two main classes. One is orthodox seeds where the seeds can be dried down to a low moisture content of around 5 percent and the second one is recalcitrant seeds. They often have very high oil content and they cannot uh, survive drying below a relatively high moisture content around greater than 20 percent and so they cannot be successfully stored for long periods whereas orthodox seeds can be stored for very long periods and good examples are grass, bamboo or grain seeds. And uh, in the case of our seed banks it is important to note the factors that uh, affect the longevity of the seeds, uh, the seeds need to be in good condition, so seeds should be matured free of mechanical damage should not have any infestation, the initial viability should be high, the age of the seeds has to be good. So, you cannot have seeds that are uh, very young or that are very old because in that case they, they will not have ample amount of viability in uh, long term storage. Then the storage conditions have to be optimum, uh, the atmosphere should have low level of oxygen. So, we generally seal these seeds, the moisture level should be low, the temperature should be low and the light should also be low or absent. And in this case the underlying principles are that when you are collecting these seeds, when you are storing these seeds, then these seeds need to have clear cut accession numbers. You need to have passport data which tells you where the seed was collected, who collected it, when was it collected and which species does it belong to, if there is any particular variety or any uh, subspecies that it belongs to that also needs to be maintained. And then uh, the seeds have to be maintained in conditions of good viability and propagability, genetic integrity needs to be maintained when you are doing a long term storage, maintenance of germplasm health so that the seeds are free from diseases and pests, so they should be able to germinate when we are putting them back into the soil. Then your facility has to have a good amount of physical security including safety from earthquakes, floods, fires and global warming availability and uh, use of germplasm. So, you need to decide on the uh, policies when and how do you make this germplasm available to different people. If people want it for research, if people want it for restocking, are you going to give it to them? What are the processes involved? Are there any costs involved? And the availability of the information regarding what all seeds are available, what all seeds are needed and so on. And a good example of such a storage facility is the Svalbard Global Seed Vault in Norway. So, this is uh, the seed vault is located in a location where uh, there is a perma, permafrost. So, all around the year this area is 
uh, well below the freezing temperatures and this is also at a very great height. So, that if there is uh, global warming and if there is flooding, if the ocean levels rise even then this facility is saved. And we keep the seeds in these different containers in these racks uh, after properly naming all of these different uh, germplasms. And similar to the case of the plant seeds, we can even have a cryopreservation facility for animal cells and tissues including sperm cells, ova cells, embryos, tissue samples and so on. And in this case, you can have it even in a laboratory where you can have these chest freezers which are maintained at a very low temperature say minus 18 degrees and in these chest freezers, you can have these different boxes in which the different samples are kept. So, that is uh, this is another example of a cryopreservation facility. So, in this lecture we looked at ex situ conservation, what does it mean, why, why is it required, when do we do ex situ conservation, when do we go for an in situ conservation method and then we looked at three different case studies of ex situ conservation facilities. We looked at the Mysore Zoo to understand what zoos are, how do they work. We looked at Christian Box Botanical Garden to understand what are botanical gardens, what do people do in botanical gardens, why are they important, how do they work and so on. And we looked at the cryopreservation facilities in terms of uh, Svalbard and in uh, terms of the animal cryopreservation facilities. So, ex situ conservation facilities are extremely important for conservation. They not only support the in situ conservation methods, but at the same time for certain species that are extremely critical, they are probably the only choices that we are left with. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.